Holy Spirit, Faithful Guide, 1. Almighty Father in heaven, in the name of your Son, our glorious and victorious Savior, Jesus Christ, we humbly ask for your blessing upon our worship of you on this, your holy and sanctified Sabbath day, so that we may grow more in our knowledge of you, our love for you, and our obedience to you. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure having the seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Amen. The devil is running scared. You can see it in the news every day how the world that Satan built is beginning to crumble. All of the lies and the fraud and the 
The phoniness of the world as it is is crumbling in on itself. Much of it. And we know that from prophecy that's what's going to happen. What doesn't fall in on itself, Christ is going to finish off by blowing it away when he gets here. So, should we be totally dismayed at the troubles that are increasing upon the world, or should we be looking forward to what will be beyond the mess that probably, as some think, is only just beginning? That it's going to get a whole lot worse before it ever gets better. But the better that will come will not come from man putting Satan's world back together again. It will become good and new based upon the kingdom of God that Christ is going to bring. Because the kingdom of God and man's kingdoms cannot coexist. They are like day and night. And we have to recognize that. Part of becoming a true Christian, which means called out ones, the church. Church doesn't mean corporation, doesn't mean building, it means called out ones, the people who come out of this world. Not meaning we're out of the world, we're still in it. And we may well suffer because of the problems that Satan's world is going to have while it destroys itself. You know, we're, we're into this as well. And the irony is, well, you know, we are, as true Christians, going to face the Great Tribulation. Not from God, because God's wrath is coming upon the evil of the world, and hopefully we will have extracted ourselves enough out of it, while still in it, to not face God's wrath. But the thing is, when you extract yourself from the world, the world is going to bring its tribulation upon you for doing that. That's what the tribulation upon God's church at the end time is going to be. Satan's wrath upon God's church. So, tribulation is coming, wrath is coming. It's just a matter, you have to choose which, which it is you want. Because the choice is made very plain. James 4.4 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And that doesn't mean hate people. We're to love our fellow man. But the world as it's built now is failing. It was doomed from the start because it was based upon Satan, his way, the ways of this world, the carnality. When Adam and Eve chose to follow Satan rather than follow God, humanity's course was set, and we're still running that course. We're doing history in the news. Well, go back to the Garden of Eden. That's a historic event, a news event, and look at the shadow, the long, long shadow of humanity on humanity that that has cast. We have to come out of the world. That's what humanity, to humanity's salvation is about, saving something. That's why Christ is called the Deliverer, to deliver us from that evil if we make the choice to do so. It's very important. Left to themselves, probably Christ doesn't really need to destroy Satan's kingdoms. They're actually just destroying themselves, but for the sake of the elect, as is quoted in Scripture, he will shorten those days. He will shorten the, the self-destruction that humans are bringing upon themselves. Matthew twenty four twenty two And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And that's a good thing. Otherwise, for the sake of his elect, his people, those who will be in the first resurrection. So, we should be concerned about what's going on in the world, but we should not be dismayed, because we know it's always darkest before the dawn. You know that old saying? Well, and perhaps at the darkest during the night, there may be a storm on top of that. But we can look beyond that. Even though we may not be able to see through the darkness, we can see and understand that there is light coming based upon this beacon, this book, that tells us what's coming. And that's a good thing, isn't it? In the news this week, for the week of December 14 to 20, December 14, 1927, Britain signed a treaty allowing for Iraqi independence. Take note of that date, 1927. Britain signed a treaty allowing for Iraqi independence. Do you think maybe history is repeating itself there a little bit? Isn't that amazing? 
just goes around and around and around. December 14, 1981, Israel annexed the Golan Heights. It had been captured from Syria during the 1967 war. And Israel has actually picked up a lot of territory, actually land that belongs to them, actually to all of Israel, but the people of Judah are there now. They won that land. They actually had to fight right from the time they began to be a nation again in, mod- in the modern day sense. They fought in wars that they did not start, but wars that they always won. And they always ended up with more territory than they had before the war. And ironically, so many people around the world call Israel the bad guy, when in fact little Israel has been the victim of wars right from its beginning. It was attacked numerous times. Uh, It came very close to losing the Yom Kippur War. The Day of Atonement was attacked from all directions, all land-sided directions. A war that it very nearly lost had it not been for some help from the United States primarily who flew in uh, emergency war supplies because they knew as well that if Israel was about to lose a war it would use its nukes, it would launch them and there goes the Middle East, much of it but the attitude has changed, hasn't it? Even many of the people that begrudgingly respected Israel if for only because they are quasi-Christians. Many of the Europeans are are very much haters of Jews, but they sort of begrudgingly respected the people of Israel, if only for the Bible's sake. But you notice how it's changed, how Israel is no longer viewed as the underdog, and how that change of attitude has happened. Even so many people in the Western world now view Israel as the aggressor, rather than this noble underdog fighting for its freedom and independence. You notice how that change, how the attitude changed? Part of it may be well to be deserved, because you know Israel, you know, is loaded with nuclear weapons, and here they are concerned that Iran is ever, is ever going to get one. As we mentioned so many times, you know, if if Iran gets one, so what? What are they going to do with it? They're going to launch it at Israel, knowing full well that Israel will send a couple hundred of them back. You know, think about it. The Iranians aren't crazy or stupid, and launching something like that would be one or both of those two things. December 15, 37, Emperor Nero was born. And from the biblical perspective, he's not mentioned uh, specifically by name, but he was reigning during the New Testament era, during the New Testament record era, and he was probably during his reign that both Peter and Paul were martyred, Many other Christians were martyred, true Christians were martyred by an absolute lunatic madman. We'll put the link on for him. One of the most evil men that ever existed is very famous. Did Nero fiddle by Rome burned? We'll put the link on for that. He didn't, by the way. Uh, That was impossible. There were no fiddles then. But he was probably involved in, in one part of that great destruction so he could rebuild. We'll put the link on for him. December 15, 1890, Sioux Chief Tatanka Ayotaka was shot and killed by Native American police who were trying to arrest him. He is better known to history as Sitting Bull. And you may remember, or that name may be familiar from Custer's Last Stand and so on. I mention that simply because the people, the Native people, their so-called Indian people, regard themselves as having been here forever. But in fact, they came from Asia. They are, in fact, related genetically to the people of China, ironically. The Europeans and Africans came across the Atlantic on sailing ships where the the native people, the Indians, as they became known, simply walked across in the wintertime of less than 20 miles of Arctic ice between Siberia and Alaska. They just walked. And they've been proven now genetically to be related to the people of China. And if you look close, you can see the similarity in appearance, apart from the scattering of the people after the Tower of Babel, which may, this may well have been part of it. December 15, 1995, West European leaders announced that the new European monetary unit would be known as the Euro, and we're going to be hearing a lot more about the Euro in the end time. Many people believe that it will be an integral part of the Mark of the Beast. It's certainly going to be involved 
But the mark of the beast is going to be more than just a monetary unit. It's going to be something that people choose to do, knowingly choose to do, having to do with it. And if you look at the mark of the beast and the signs, the identifying signs with that, it involves more than just what kind of money you use or don't use. There's much more to that. We'll put the link on for that. December 16, 1485, Catherine of Aragon, the first wife of King Henry VIII of England, was born. Henry divorced her without papal approval, starting the English Reformation. So there was a time when the papacy was dictating to foreign kings in their own country. And December 17, related to that, 1538, Pope Paul III excommunicated King Henry VIII after he defied Rome and established himself as head of the Church of England. British monarchs remain as head of the Anglican Church right to the present day. And whether Henry did that out of some sort of great religious uh, defiance toward what he believed was a corrupt religious leader in Rome, or whether he did it simply because he wanted to marry another woman, which is likely what he wanted to do more than anything, uh, nevertheless some good came out of it. It may have been a beginning of the Protestant Reformation. It certainly helped England in its freedom, and our freedom beyond that, because Britain, through its colonies, uh, founded us here in North America, many of us. December 16, 1773, is a protest of the tax on tea from England, a group of American colonists disguised as Indians threw chests of tea from British ships into Boston Harbor. The incident became known as the Boston Tea Party. Of course, it's a very famous incident from the American Revolution. Again, you can see how trade and commerce was very much what the British Empire was about. And again, December 20, 1606, long before that, over 150 years before that, Virginia Company settlers left London to establish Jamestown, another very famous settlement. And their company it says Virginia Company Settlers. And that's we mentioned last week how so much of the British and English colonialism was based upon trade. Here in Canada, we had the Hudson's Bay Company. Uh, as I understand, our first money, paper money, that was printed in Canada was printed by not by the government, but by the Hudson's Bay Company for trade. December 16, 1920, one of the worst earthquakes of all time occurred in Kansu Province, China, killing 180,000 people. Imagine that, 180,000 people killed in earthquakes, and yet we read also in Prophecy, we'll put the link on for that, how great earthquakes are coming, and perhaps in places that uh, we're not expecting, or are beginning to suspect again. Uh, many people, for example, in North America, this great San Andreas Fault is regarded as probably where the big one in most people's minds where it's going to come, but scientists are becoming, geologists are becoming more concerned with the New Madrid Fault, which is along the Mississippi. Great earthquake has already happened there, and there is a widely recognized, no pun intended, fault there, and they're thinking that maybe that's where the big one uh, in this part of the world, if it happens, it may be along the Mississippi rather than out in California. Probably what will happen in both of them, actually, in the end of time, because earthquakes are going to happen all around the world. But this one in China, 180,000 people, and you consider, you know, a really major earthquake along so many major cities have been built along earthquake faults, knowingly and unknowingly that that kind of death toll could tragically occur, can happen. December 17, 1843, A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens was first published. And, of course, Old Scrooge, very famous this time of year. Many regard, of course, Christian uh, Christmas as not the time of the birth of Christ, and that's true. But, you know, the Christmas Carol, Old Scrooge, there is a lesson there. He actually became, he went from being a, a miserly, lonely man to someone who repented and became very Christian, very loving toward his fellow man. His wealth, he began using it in a way that was beneficial rather than pinching every penny and, and for what? So he could die rich. I mean, what was the point of that? And he began helping people. And you can see there how, again, in the Bible, the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, man was actually about two rich men. One that was righteous toward his fellow man and the other one who, who led a, a beggar a poor beggar starved to death on his front gate. 
I mean, you know, the, the difference there. And there was a time, probably old Scrooge would have done that. But at the end of that film, at the end of the book, uh, he didn't. He repented. He became very Christian in his view from his fellow man. December 17, 1914, Jews were expelled from Tel Aviv by the Ottoman or Turkish authorities who then controlled Israel. Now imagine that. Tel Aviv, today the functional capital of Israel, Jews were expelled there by the Ottomans, uh, which was the, the Turkish Empire that made the mistake of siding with Germany at the time of the First World War, and when they lost, uh, Britain uh, took over much of the Middle East, including the land of Israel. They occupied it. That occupation permitted the people of Israel, the people of Judah. It got them a foothold in that land, so by the end of the 1940s, they were able to fight their war of independence. Many of them actually had British uh, military training, ironically, because they were fighting the British at the end as well. December 17, 1969, the United States Air Force officially closed Project Blue Book with the conclusion that no evidence existed to prove that thousands of UFO sightings were the result of extraterrestrials. And, of course, many people say uh, don't agree with that. They believe in them and whether or not they exist they can't be as far as we know there are no other living creatures created on other planets as far as we know according to the Bible we are the only ones uh, that doesn't mean that demons can't play tricks with things but you know there is coming in the minds of many people an invasion from outer space sort of because upon Christ's return a lot of people aren't going to believe or recognize what's coming even many Christians aren't because they don't either don't are not aware of the biblical very plain statement that Christ is returning or they'll think it's just some sort of or they think it's just some sort of philosophy philosophical idea because to them why would Christ return you know they believe you live your life a good life when you die and you go to heaven but the fact is heaven's coming here paradise is coming here Christ is returning to begin to build the kingdom of God on earth to create the paradise after which the Father God is coming with the link on for that throne of God from heaven to earth December 18, 1865 the 13th amendment abolished slavery in the United States and isn't it amazing how far that has come now that there is a black man who has been elected the president of the United States December 18, 1916, during the First World War, the Battle of Verdun ended after 10 months of fighting. France and Germany lost 330,000 killed and wounded. And that's back in the First World War. So you can see, you know, the, the primitive weapons that they had, mostly rifles and heavy artillery. They didn't have many aircraft yet to deliver bombs and all that, but they sure could run up the death tolls. 330,000 killed and wounded. So war has been a bloody thing, not only in modern times, but even back then. The, the, the losses of life, people killed and maimed, were absolutely huge. December 18, 1939, uh, and Canada certainly had its uh, contribution to the First World War and of the Second and the Korean War. Uh, December 18, 1939, at the start of the Second World War, the first contingent of Canadian troops arrived in Britain to join with the British in the war against Hitler. The troops of the 1st Canadian Division had sailed from Halifax on December 10 in five ocean liners accompanied by the Royal Canadian Navy battleship Resolution. When they reached the Clyde, there was a great array of British sea power to welcome them. Winston Churchill, then First Lord of the Admiralty, broadcast the news of the Canadians' arrival with his famous, It has warmed the cockles of our hearts. And that, again, I think I mentioned that last week, that we have never actually had a, a big war of our own. We've had to sort of hitch a ride along with everybody else's, primarily the United States and Britain. And in the Second World War, when Hitler invaded Poland, uh, Britain declared war on Germany for that invasion, and we did as well. As soon as Britain did, we did. And when the U.S. was attacked at Pearl Harbor, we declared war on Japan because of that attack. And neither We weren't attacked by either side, but we declared war on them in Bo at both. And amazingly, considering the relatively small population, we had over a million people in uniform. A million-man army. 
which is amazing. December 20, 69. Roman Emperor Vitellius was brutally murdered by the supporters of his rival Vespasian. And the Roman Emperors, their number one problem was not assassination by foreign enemies. It was assassination by someone else who wanted the job. I will put the link on for those uh, New Testament Roman Emperors. It was a dangerous profession, being Roman Emperor. December 20, 1552, Katharina von Bora died at age 53. The former nun married Protestant reformer Martin Luther in 1525 when Luther was 42 and she was 26. They had six children. So Martin Luther, the former monk, married a former nun and they had six children. December 20, 1922, 14 Russian republics were combined as the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The USSR lasted 70 years. That was not all that long ago where there was the Cold War and the world was divided into two camps, more or less, and the Iron Curtain and all of that, and just all of a sudden it just all collapsed. And people thought the Cold War would go on forever and the Berlin Wall would be there forever and the Iron Curtain would be there forever and it just came down very, very fast. It shows how fast things can change. History in the news. All that is old is new again. Our question of the week this week, should Christians observe Hanukkah? Because it is found in the Bible as Jesus Christ observed it. We'll put the links on for that. And the answer is, if you are a Jewish Christian, then yes, you should observe your Hanukkah. But if you are not, if you are just a Christian from uh, some other religion or a convert to Christianity, then why would you? It's, it's, it's primarily a holy day or observance of the people of Judah because of a specific event in their history. We'll put the link on for the Maccabees to understand how Hanukkah came about. Purim is another one from the time of Esther, which again a specific element of the history of the people of Judah. There is a big however and but to that however because Christ's reference to the prophecy that will be fulfilled at the time just prior to his return, that abomination of desolation. Hanukkah came about from the original abomination of desolation, an event in Bible history in which the temple was defiled by Antiochus Epiphanes. He slaughtered a pig in the temple and from that event the Hasmoneans or Maccabees rose up and not only actually kicked them out, kicked the, the pagans out of that temple, but actually restored the kingdom of Judah for over a century. They, it was amazing that they were able to do that. But it was from that event that Christ's warning of an abomination of desolation, which will occur just prior to his return, is going to happen. And uh, Christ making that prophecy and how his warning about that abomination of desolation that's coming was a warning to Christians. So you see, it has a Christian application in the sense that the abomination of desolation, that prophecy, not observing the Holy Day, or not observing Hanukkah, because as I said, it's an event specific to the people of Judah. Christ observed it because he was a Jew. But And if you are a Jewish Christian, then you would probably observe it, because it's a part of your being a Jew. But it is not something you need to, to observe as along with the other holy days. We'll put the links on for those things. How the abomination of desolation and all of the other prophecies related, primarily through Matthew 24, there's a very concise listing of that. And in that also is that specific prophecy and warning. And interestingly as well, it refers to winter. And Hanukkah observe, is observed in winter. So some may draw the connection from that that Christ's return will be in winter at the time of Hanukkah. But it's not entirely what he said. He said, pray that your flight not take place in winter or on the Sabbath, and Sabbaths happen all year round. So you see the point there. But read the study, uh, The Abomination of Desolation, where and the Maccabees to understand the origin of Hanukkah and how, although it is of an observance of the people of Judah from their history, it does have a Christian prophetic application in the end time just before Christ's return. It's not something that we need to observe as Christians, but it is something, an event, a prophecy that is related to that original abomination of desolation that will be fulfilled in the time prior to Christ's return. 
Matthew 24, 15 to 22, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains, let them which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes, and woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. And again, there's that verse that we quoted from our news item at the beginning of our news items, so you can see how it is all connected. But no, as Christians, we don't have to observe Hanukkah. If you are a Jewish Christian, yes, you probably will. And Christ observed it, but it is not something, because it is not specific from our history as people who are not of the history of Judah. Read those two studies to understand more fully. Sweet Hour of Prayer 1. Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground 
and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. From Genesis 2-7 is one of the most well-known verses of the Bible. It is the beginning of the beginnings of humanity's journey to its ultimate creation, because, you know, God doesn't look like a, a mere carnal physical human, that we are being created in God's own image, spiritual image, because God is not physical, He's spirit. And that is our ultimate destiny as children of God. We are born physical, created physical, with the purpose that those of us who choose not to make it may be rendered inert as the ground from which we came, the lifeless, dead ground. Actually, clay isn't really dead because it was never alive in itself, but it can become a living vessel. The elements that make up our physical bodies are themselves dead. It's only when we live inside of them that we are a living soul. And by the way, souls can die. We'll put the link on for that study. Where is your soul? It's a surprising thing because to most Christian professing people, it's something that's immortal, that it can go on forever, one way or another. I guess they believe that it can feel pain because the soul's in in hell can burn, even though a soul is immortal. Supposedly spirit, then I would assume they think it is, and therefore they must think it can feel pain. But the truth is, from the Word of God, that souls can die. Souls are simply a, a living creature, a living creation. Animals have a soul. Again, I'll put the link on for that study. It simply means a living creature. And when the creature is done living inside of its vessel, the vessel's elements return to where they came from, back to the earth. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Very famous, well-known saying. It's often ignored in many ways. If you understand what soul means, and you put that together with ashes to ashes, dust to dust, it's obvious that the dead really are dead, awaiting a resurrection of one kind or another. The actual Hebrew word there that is translated into English as dust is more literally describing powdered clay. It's very fine powdered clay, something that would be used as a potter. And as we'll get to, the analogy continues on because in many ways Christ, who was given to come to this earth and create humanity, we'll put the link on for Christ the Creator, the Father hasn't been here yet, Christ plainly said, no one has seen the Father, and yet a lot of people saw the Lord God. Moses did. Many of the other people, the elders along with Moses saw him. Certainly Jacob did. Jacob wrestled with him. Abraham and Sarah had lunch with him on the day before he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain down there. So, you can understand how Christ would have the connection as the analogy of a potter and how that creation actually happened once physically at the creation of man or autumn in the Hebrew but you know it's going to happen again the very same sort of thing Isaiah 26 19 thy dead men shall live together with my dead body shall they rise awake and sing Ye that dwell in the dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. And that's describing the physical resurrection. Primarily, the day of Christ's return, all of the true people of God will be resurrected to spirit. I will put the link on for that, why there is two sorts of resurrections, one to spirit, the first one to spirit on the day of Christ's return. The later one, however, physical again. Just the same as Adam was created from the elements. All of those dead people who hadn't come to realize the truth of the Word of God and been given the means to understand it will then, at that time, be given the means to understand it. And that's the reason they're created physical. If your time is now, your judgment day is now. So if you are a true Christian right now who understands 
the Word of God, you have two possible futures. If you understand now. Because there are no second chances. Some people believe that we teach a second chance. Well, no. You can't have a second chance if you never had a, a first one. There is only one judgment time. And if you are a true Christian now, just as all the people from throughout the ages, there are two possibilities. If you have accepted that offer of, of repentance as made possible by the Holy Spirit, you will be resurrected or changed if you're alive on the day of Christ's return to spirit on that day. Everybody, to meet the Lord in the air. Put the link on for that. On the other hand, if you came to know the truth and you rejected it, you won't be resurrected on the day of Christ's return. You will stay dead until the end of the 1,000 years. You will be resurrected physical and cast into the lake of fire to be incinerated, obliterated, as though you never existed. And that's the reason primarily there are two kinds of resurrections. But again, you can see how clay is used as an analogy. And it's more than that, actually, because it's a direct... We are the elements of the earth. When we die physically, our bodies return to the earth from which it came. And the resurrection body, you know, the one that dies is not the one that's going to come back because the elements of our physical bodies are everywhere. Throughout the earth, those chemical elements are there. Water, we're mostly water more than anything else so it doesn't matter you don't need the same bits of calcium and iron and oxygen and hydrogen that is made by water or makes water because one's as good as the other you can't tell one calcium atom from another or one iron atom from another it doesn't matter but that won't matter if you are a true Christian because you'll be resurrected spirit the links on for that one. When will you be judged? But it's interesting how Christ uses that analogy as a potter as well because one of his most famous verses, he'll rule the world with a rod of iron. You know, potters use that if something doesn't turn out very well they'll break it with a rod of iron rather than taking up space. And that's what really we are without the Holy Spirit. An empty vessel. And in fact, if the Lord withdrew the living power that we all have, we would all be dead. All of humanity would simply drop dead without that life force that animates us. We are not animals, but we are animated. We'll put the link on for that. Daily Bible Study Online um, has been there now, I think we're going on 13 or 14 years. And one of the ways that I've known and can tell how much we have published is that rarely now rarely does anyone ask a question send an email in and ask a question that has not been covered by a study or a sermon now at least once online and that's it shows that we've gone from the beginning to the end of the Bible and at least given attention to practically every verse and you can do that if you actually read the entire Bible that's what will happen that you can't ignore something when you're teaching something if you have read the entire word of God you can't teach something in contradiction to another verse and most of those verses will ring out Oftentimes, if you're writing something and if there's a contradiction the verse will actually pop into your head and tell you that can't be right and it's actually the Holy Spirit actually doing it, isn't it? We know that. But I've seen people who've written sometimes and they will have, people who've not read the entire Word of God, a part of that vessel that they are has a vacuum sort of in it because they will miss something. They'll miss points. They can be very right in the parts that they have read, but if they leave out other parts... They can be right, but be wrong. And that sort of is a very good, perhaps, analogy of the state of the Christian professing world today. Part of their vessel is empty. There's like a bubble in there. That void 
that's missing because they've not read the entire Word of God. And even if you have the Holy Spirit, you know, it doesn't just pour into your mind. The knowledge doesn't. The means to understand certainly does, but you still have to make the effort to learn. And that's part of living a life of overcoming, to know that and be a useful vessel to our Lord, to our Creator, to that great potter who created us from the clay and the elements of the earth and put inside of us the means to make us useful. It's interesting as well that many people have wondered, it's certainly wrong, and it's understandable why the Lord would be angry at people who create idols, and they make them out of clay, and plaster, whatever, and to worship them, you can see how blasphemous that is, how insulting it would be to the creator of the entire universe and reduce him to a plaster dummy. But you know, it could be as well, along with that, by taking clay from the earth and creating a, a man or a woman, a human, is almost like a mockery of creation. Because that's what the Lord did. It isn't just mocking Him, but it's mocking the very creation of humanity by creating images in the likeness of humans. Because that's what the Lord did. The difference, though, that He put life into those humans. Whereas man doesn't. Man just sort of creates the the image, but worships it as though it were alive. So you can see there's a, a part of that there that's almost a mockery of creation. Another reason that the Lord would be angry at it. Some have read the verses such as this one. We'll, we'll read Romans 9, 17-23, For the Scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the powder power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of his wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory? So it's just saying that the Lord is the absolute king. He can take from the very earth and create in a purpose, for whatever purpose, someone who, such as the Pharaoh, who served a godly purpose, he resisted the Lord to demonstrate, as we just read there, the Lord's power. But do you think someday that the Pharaoh is going to be resurrected physical and be given a chance to understand? Well, why not? Did what he did any different than what some Christians, some people who became Christians already, have done? Would they be so different? And you know, Christ is about forgiveness. And interestingly as well, the Pharaoh and the Exodus and the Passover and all of that, that Lord, the blood the sacrifice of the Lamb of God and so on, back then just a a regular, literal lamb. But that was Christ, even back then at the time of Pharaoh. That's Christ saying that. How that purpose of being a chosen vessel for whatever purpose, for the greater good of the house. Because keep in mind, I know I emphasize this one, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. I know I emphasize those verses as much as I can. I don't miss a chance. 
I take every opportunity to emphasize that because if people could understand, were willing to understand that reality, they wouldn't disdainfully ignore half of their Holy Bibles to begin with. Because in doing so, you know, the, much of what is in the whole so-called Old Testament hasn't happened yet. It describes first and second comings of Christ. It describes the fu- yet future in our time, future from our time, kingdom of God. How people in the kingdom of God will will be observing the Feast of Tabernacles, as we read the in the end of Zechariah. How all of those things haven't happened yet, but it's Christ. It always has been. He was the creator. He was the potter. He was those the one who used those in his service, one way or another, either you're in direct obedience or in opposition. You see why the analogy is used. How he has been the potter, who's molded and shaped humanity for humanity's purpose. Not for the Lord's purpose. He doesn't need us. He's come to create in us and for us to be children of God. So who benefits? He's not getting anything he doesn't already have. He has come to give us something that we could never have without him. Not just physical life, which he also gave us as well, but spiritual life. But if we choose to throw it away, again, the original potter, Christ, that rock was Christ. Psalm 2 9, thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Most people think of the rod of iron ruling with a rod of iron. We read of that in the book of Revelation. Well, here it is in Psalms. Psalm 2 9. You can see it's always been the same potter, the same creator, how that vessel that we are are part of a greater vessel the household of God that's being built over time but for all time an eternal household and we are there to serve you know many people too think of eternal life or they go to heaven and assume they're just going to sit around up on some cloud somewhere maybe strum a harp or whatever But don't you think that would get pretty boring after a while? An eternity of nothing? Nothing useful? Of just being, what, alive? Alive, but that's hardly living, is it? It does speak of a rest. That's true. But not an eternal idleness sort of rest. We'll be resting from the labors of this physical existence in that we'll never get tired we'll never be weary of anything or bored with anything because life will be about what is good and an eternity imagine a a to-do list that has no end and that's a good thing because we'll have the interest in the service as vessels of the Holy Spirit to serve Christ who serves God because God's coming to to this earth and it's the Holy Spirit in our vessel that not only gives us the physical life but will give us eternal life that spirit being even though it's here now not only to keep our physical lives going that pneuma, we'll put the link on for that, how the Holy Spirit is the breath of life, physically and spiritually, but how we can look to be something, within something, and not be empty anymore. Because spirit isn't contained by physicalness, is it? So the analogy of a vessel at that future time will be different. We won't need the vessel anymore. 2 Corinthians 4, 6-10 For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face 
of Jesus Christ. But we have in this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our body. And you can see how it's a purposeful existence. It isn't just something that's there, existing, useless. How many people clean out their homes? They'll say, well, there's something I don't use anymore. It's just sitting there taking up space. Throw it out. Is that a fair analogy? If it's just there taking up space, what good is it? Even though it might be something very good if it was put to use. But something isn't good if it isn't made useful. Acts 9, 15 to 16. The Apostle Paul. Consider. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Paul surely did, didn't he? He was once a persecutor of Christ, and upon his conversion he almost immediately became a persecuted Christian, along with those who he once persecuted. But he was a vessel of the Holy Spirit, a vessel of the Gospel. He was a living manifest of the Spirit of God in an earthen vessel. And you can see there how the analogy becomes a matter of making use of something, something good. Because, you know, if Paul had, had refused to go, what would have happened to it? Consider, he would have made himself a very useless vessel, wouldn't he? He wouldn't have been much good to himself or to anyone else. And how do we be good? What is it that makes us good, truly good in the eyes of God? Not just in our own eyes, but truly good? 1 Thessalonians 4, 1-8 Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. And you know, commandments are the way to being free. Because when the world comes to the point where it is able to obey the principles of the Ten Commandments, imagine what a world it's going to be. There'll be no more war, no more murdering, no more deception, no more anything bad, no more wars of religion, no more conflicts, no more people thinking badly of one another because they don't understand the Lord's truth. It's all going to be very clear what a world that's going to be. A world set free of the debauchery that it is today. As we said in our, our news item, the world is going down on its own. The foundation upon which the world was built, the entire world, every country on earth, was not based upon the principles of God's law. If it were, there was nothing that would shake them. Nothing. Continuing, verse 3, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Now, sanctification is the word we get from which we get saint. It means set apart. And fornication there, that is referring to literal fornication, but it's also talking about religious fornication. That's why the Church of Rome is called the Great Harlot because of the politics that it became involved in. And why shouldn't it? It's no surprise that it was, because it was created by the Roman Empire. That's why it's called the Church of Rome. You know, if it was truly Christian, why wouldn't it be called the Church of, of Jerusalem? Because that's where the church was headquartered at the time the apostles were around there. 
Why isn't it called the Church of, of Jerusalem then? You know, why Rome? Why should it be Rome? Well, because it was created by the Roman Empire. The politics. It was a matter of politics. And it's been involved in politics ever since. Verse 4, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. So don't fill yourself with bad things. Fill yourself with what is good. And if you are truly a Christian, you've got the Holy Spirit. So don't defile it. Don't adulterate it with other things. Spiritual adultery as well. Verse 5, not in the lust of concupiscence even as the Gentiles, which know not God. Concupiscence is an interesting principle. We'll put the link on for that, because it also deals with a vessel. And how, I've used the analogy of why empty water tanks don't leak. They can be full of holes, but they're perfectly free of leaks, whereas something that is full can be leaking. Again, you see the analogy there, how a useful vessel can be imperfect, but still doing its job, well, something else that is totally useless can appear, appear perfect because it's not doing anything. You see, and that's, that's the world, isn't it? It just seems that the world is determined to do it just that very same way. Where something that is good is viewed as either silly or wrong or, or boring or whatever, just anything but the good that it truly is and useful that it really is. Because our doing good, that doesn't do God any, any, any good. He doesn't benefit from it. He's already got everything. He's already perfect. We are the only ones that benefit by doing good for ourselves. Because good is what works. Good is how to stay out of, out of problems in this world. But humans haven't learned that yet. And even those in the true church of God are still human we still have our problems. Verse 6, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. Thank you for joining us for services this week. As always, your being with us makes our joy complete. Until next week when we meet again on this, God's holy Sabbath day, may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. God bless you all. Savior, again to thy dear name. Parting him. One.
four.